Hello and welcome to this service of worship in Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Before we begin the service properly, let me give a few announcements. Join us uh, on Zoom on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock for our prayer meeting, and it's important that we pray at this time, asking for God's mercy on the world as we go through this coronavirus crisis. And we can pray for one another here in Emmanuel, and we can pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. Then we hope to have another online service of worship next Sunday, so uh, watch out for that. And then if you're a su subscriber to the Presbyterian Herald, please note that there will only be four editions this year, but you will receive them free of charge. If anyone would like to take out a new subscription, which also will be free of charge this year, please give your name to Jennifer Stewart or let me know and I'll pass on your name to Jennifer. But we're here to worship God and in Psalm 92 we read these words. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by the work of your hand. At the work of your hands I sing for joy. Let's praise God by singing, The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still water. His goodness restores my soul And I will trust in you alone And I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me Your goodness will lead my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with oil and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delights and I will trust in you It is always good to come before you and to give thanks to you for your goodness to us. 
We praise you because you care for us the way a shepherd cares for his sheep. And so just as the shepherd provides his sheep with food and water, so you provide for us, giving us every good thing that we need for this life. Just as a shepherd gives his sheep rest, so you give us rest for our souls. Just as the shepherd leads his sheep, so you lead and guide us along paths of righteousness. And just as the shepherd protects his sheep, so you are with us to protect us from all evil. And we give thanks to you because you promised that your goodness and your mercy will follow us all the days of our life, so that every day we can look to you for the help we need to cope with whatever trials and troubles we encounter. And then you've given us the great hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in your presence, so that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we know we don't deserve any of these good things because we're sinners and we all like sheep have gone astray and we have broken your laws and your commands and thought and word and deed. You have commanded us to do all things for your glory, but we have dishonored you by the things we have done. You have commanded us to do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to you through him. But we confess that we have done what the Lord Jesus forbids, and we have murmured and complained. You have commanded us to live our lives for Christ who died for us and who was raised, but we have lived for ourselves. You have commanded us to submit to one another, but we confess that often we are in conflict with one another. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are sinners. We pray now that you will forgive us our sins and that you'll cleanse us from all that is not right. And we ask this not because we deserve it, but because Christ our Saviour has paid for our sins with his life and he shed his blood to cleanse us. And so for his sake, will you forgive us? And will you renew us in your image by your Spirit who lives in us to enable us to walk in your ways and to do your will more and more? And help us to worship you today. Even though we are separated from one another, will you draw near to us and speak to us through your word? And will you help us to receive your word with faith and humility? Will you ensure that your word bears fruit in our lives so that those who don't believe will be convinced and converted to faith in Christ and those who already believe will be built up in holiness and comfort through faith in your Son? And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear the good news from 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Got some pictures to show to the boys and girls again, and uh, here's the first one. Here's the first one. Um, in the reading in a few minutes, we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel again. And we've been reading from 1 Samuel for a number of weeks. And uh, we've been reading about this man. Uh, I wonder if you can uh, remember who this is, the man who's uh, crouching down, uh, the one who's kneeling down. He is, he's a picture, well, it's a picture of David. And uh, that's Samuel. And Samuel was anointing David to be the king now, in, this, in the chapter of the Bible we're going to read in a few minutes, we don't read about David, but we read about another king, King Saul, who was the king before David. And Saul was a wicked king, but David was a good king who loved the Lord and who tried to do the Lord's will. And so we've been reading about and thinking about kings, and so this was the king of God's people at that time, King David. That's the first picture. And here's the second one. And uh, so we're looking at the, the man on the right uh, with the, uh, the white beard. And I've already said his name. He's Samuel. 
And uh, the book, of course, 1 Samuel, it's named after him. And Samuel, I'm sure you remember, was a prophet. So there he is. He's uh, preaching to the people because that's what prophets did. Uh, they received God's word and they proclaimed it to God's people. So there are all the Israelites and they're listening to Samuel as he preaches to them and as he tells them uh, the word of the Lord and this message from God. So there's a king and then there's the prophet David and Samuel. And we're going to be reading about uh, Samuel again in a few minutes. But then uh, we've got a picture here. Of so we've had the king and we've had the prophet and now there's this man here. I wonder if you can tell who this is. We're not going to be reading about this person in the reading in a few minutes, but nevertheless, we have read about somebody like this in the book of 1 Samuel already. This, of course, is the priest. You know it's the priest because, well, he's got that breastplate on his chest, and if you count up the number of squares, they're meant to be precious stones or diamonds, and if you count them up, you'll, know, you'll discover that there are four of them, four of those colored squares on his breastplate. And those four colored squares, they symbolize the tribes of Israel. There were 12 tribes of Israel. So they symbolize all of God's people. And it was the job of the priest to go into the presence of God. And there he, he represented all of God's people. He was there on their behalf to pray for them and to ask God to be merciful to them. And you'll see on his forehead, he's got, uh, it looks like a, a gold badge. And uh, you can't see it, but on it it says, uh, holy to the Lord, because the, the priest was dedicated to doing God's work. And uh, we have read about a priest already in the book of 1 Samuel, near the beginning. I wonder if you can remember the name of the priest. He was an old man and uh, his name began with E and uh, his name was, I wonder can you guess, it was Eli, Eli the priest. He was one of the priests we read about in the Bible. So there you are in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, we come across the king, King David. We come across the prophet, that's Samuel. And then of course there are priests as well. And one of the priests we've read about is Eli. So we read about all those different people in the book of 1 Samuel. But of course, uh, David was only the king for the time being. He was the king at that time. And there's a king, though, who is forever. And Samuel, he was a prophet at that time. But uh, there's a prophet who is a prophet forever. And then the priest, well, Eli was a priest at that time. But there's a priest who is the priest forever. And I'm thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord Jesus Christ is our King forever. After he died and was raised in new life, he, was, he went up to heaven where he's enthroned as a King over all. And right now he's, uh, he's uh, uh, building his kingdom on the earth, calling men and women and boys and girls, just like you, into his kingdom to love him and to serve him. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our great prophet, our prophet forever, because he declares to us the word of the Lord, and he tells us about God's willingness to forgive us all of our sins and to give us eternal life. And the Lord Jesus is our priest forever. When he was here on earth, he offered himself on the cross as the perfect sacrifice to take away our sins so that we can have peace with God. And even now that he's in heaven, he's still doing the work of a priest. Because in heaven, he's praying for us and praying for all of his people. And so as we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel, we've been reading about kings, we've been reading about prophets, we've been reading about priests, and they all point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great king, our great prophet, and our great priest. He came into the world to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. Let's give thanks to God for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great King, who loved us and who gave up his life for us, and who is now King in heaven, and he rules over everything, and uh, he rules over everything to help his people. 
And we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is our great prophet and he came to make known to us your willingness to forgive us from our sins and to give us eternal life. And we thank you that he is our great priest and that he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to uh, take away our sins. And even now he's in heaven and he's praying for us all the time. And so we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll help us all to trust in him and to rely on him alone for salvation and help us every day to give thanks to you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from God's word now from 1 Samuel. And the reading is chapter 28, verses 3 to 25. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 25. And this is the word of the Lord. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have he set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her, By the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbours, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maid servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once, she took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night they got up 
and land. And we end the reading there at the end of the chapter, and we thank God for his word to us today. Let's pray for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week we read uh, how David went to live among the Philistines for a time. And though it may have looked from one angle that he had lost his way and that he was now siding with Israel's enemies, he was in fact doing what the Lord's anointed king was supposed to do because he took over the city of Ziklag, which is part of the promised land, and he conquered the enemies of the Lord who were living in the land at that time. But the passage we read last week ended with the king of Gath making clear to David that he expected David to accompany him and all the Philistines when they attacked the Israelites. So what would David do? Will he really go along with the king of Gath? Will he really attack his own people in Israel? What will David do? But instead of telling us what happened next to David, our narrator switches his attention to Saul. What was Saul doing at that time? Well, it's clear from today's passage that whereas David was doing the will of the Lord, Saul was doing something which the Lord had forbidden. At the end of today's passage, Saul receives a word of condemnation because it was revealed to him that he and his sons were about to die and the Lord was going to hand over Israel to the Philistines. The people of Israel, they wanted a king to lead them and to go out before them and to fight their battles. But Saul was not the right person to lead them because it's clear that he was on the broad road, the road of unbelief and rebellion, which only leads to destruction. But David was to be their new and better king who would lead them to victory. And David foreshadowed the Lord's true anointed king, who is Jesus Christ, the Savior, who was obedient to his heavenly father in all things and who leads his people to eternal life. So that's what we're going to be thinking about today. Verses 3 to 6 of today's passage provide the background to what happens in the rest of this chapter. And our narrator tells us four things as background. Firstly, the narrator reminds us that Samuel was dead. We already know that because it was recorded for us back in chapter 25. But the narrator is reminding us of Samuel's death because of what happens in this chapter. Secondly, the narrator tells us that Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 19 and in Leviticus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, the Lord forbade his people from consulting mediums and spiritists and those who contacted the dead. It seems the pagan nations around Israel would consult such people, mediums and spiritists, in order to discern the will of their gods. And the Lord forbade his holy people from following the practice of the nations, because he was going to make his will known to them in other ways. And it seems that at an earlier stage in Saul's life, Saul had wanted to do the will of the Lord and he had banned mediums from the land. And the narrator tells us that because of what happens in this chapter. Thirdly, the narrator tells us that the Philistines had assembled to fight against the Israelites. And Saul had gathered together all of his forces to fight against the Philistines. And if you've got your Bible open, if you look at verse 5, it tells us that when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. And we need to know that because of what happened in this chapter. And fourthly, according to verse 6, 
Saul had inquired of the Lord. Presumably he wanted guidance from the Lord about what to do about the Philistines. However, we're told that the Lord did not answer him, not by dreams and not by the Urim and not by the prophets. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, we read of how the Lord would uh, reveal his will by means of dreams. Think of the dreams the Pharaoh had in the days of Joseph. Or think of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the days of Daniel. And I've mentioned before that the Urim and the Thummim were these stones which the priests would use to discern God's will. And of course the Old Testament is filled with messages which the Lord revealed through his prophets who spoke the word of the Lord in those days to his people. But even though the Lord often revealed his will through these means, on this occasion, he remained silent. He remained silent. I was listening to another preacher and he made the point that when a man's wife is giving him the silent treatment, she's still speaking loud and clear. And by giving Saul the silent treatment, the Lord was speaking loud and clear to Saul that he was not pleased with Saul. After all, uh, Saul's problem in the past was though he knew God's will, he disregarded God's will. So think back to chapter 15 when the Lord commanded Saul to destroy the Amalekites and all of their livestock. But Saul had spared their king and their livestock, their animals. And when Samuel confronted Saul about his disobedience, Saul claimed he kept alive the livestock so that he could sacrifice some of it to the Lord. And uh, Samuel said to him at that time, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. He was saying, you should have obeyed the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. He wants your obedience. And because Saul had rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord rejected him as king of his people. And because the Lord had rejected him as king of his people, the Lord now remained silent. So that's the background to today's passage. Samuel is dead. Saul has long ago expelled the mediums from the land. Saul was afraid because of the Philistines, and the Lord was being silent. Since Saul had once expelled mediums from the land, verse 7 is surprising, isn't it? In verse 7, he tells his attendants to find him a woman who is a spiritist, or a medium, because he wants to go and inquire of her. Since the Lord will not answer him, Perhaps there's another way for him to know what the future holds. Perhaps a medium will be able to consult the dead on his behalf in order to find out what he should do about the Philistines. Though he wants to ban mediums from the land, he's now so desperate and his heart has become so hard that he once again disregards the word of the Lord who had forbidden mediums and he now wants to visit one himself. And his attendants tell him about this woman who lives in Endor. Getting there isn't straightforward, apparently, because Endor lies behind enemy lines. Nevertheless, Saul disguised himself, and he and two of his men set off in the night, under the cover of darkness, to go and see this woman. And when they arrived, Saul hides his true identity from the woman, and asks her to bring up from the dead, the person he was. Now she's worried that this may be a trap because she knows that King Saul has banned mediums from the land. So is this man who has come to her trying to trap her? Is he going to arrest her and hand her over to Saul if she does what he has asked? And remember, of course, she doesn't know that she's talking to Saul. So she's worried that this might be a trap. And so, to reassure her, Saul swore to her by the Lord that this was not a trap and she will not die. Notice that he swears 
by the Lord. So in the name of the Lord, he's asking her to do something which the Lord has forbidden. It makes no sense, does it? Well, reassured by his oath, she agrees. Whom shall I bring up for you, she asks. Bring up Samuel, he said. And of course, at the beginning of the chapter, we were reminded that Samuel was dead. Uh, so can this woman really summon Samuel? Can she really summon the dead? Uh, Jewish and Christian commentators on the Bible have discussed this question down through the years. Some have suggested that the, the spirit who appeared was not really Samuel, but it was only an evil spirit pretending to be Samuel, because it seems unlikely that the Lord will use a forbidden practice to reveal his will to Saul. And the Lord wouldn't allow a wicked woman to have power over Samuel and be able to summon him at will. However, then others claim that it must be Samuel because he was able to predict the future accurately. And in that case, perhaps it wasn't the woman who called him, but it was the Lord who sent him. And so the commentators discuss whether this woman was really able to summon the dead, was she really able to summon Samuel? Of course, all we have to go on is the text and the text which of course is God's inspired word to us and therefore true, it tells us that the woman saw Samuel. And when she saw him, she cried out at the top of her voice. Uh, and uh, she was afraid and shocked and surprised. So though she was a medium and claimed to be able to consult the dead, perhaps this was actually the first time anything like this had ever happened to her. And she also realizes now that the man who's asked her to summon Samuel is, in fact, Saul. And Saul wants to know what she can see. And the woman describes Samuel in such a way that his identity is clear to Saul. And Samuel, who has been summoned, wants to know why Saul has disturbed him and brought him up from the dead. Well, Saul pours out his complaint in verse 15. He says, I'm in great distress. The Philistines are fighting against me. God has turned away from me. What can I do? What can I do? Well, there's nothing he can do, is there? Samuel tells him plainly that the Lord has turned away from him and become Saul's enemy. In other words, instead of fighting on Saul's behalf, the Lord is fighting against Saul. He has sent the Philistines against Saul as an act of judgment on Saul for his unbelief and his rebellion because he didn't obey the word of the Lord when the Lord commanded him to destroy the Amalekites. And so the Lord is doing what he said he would do. He's taking the kingdom from Saul and he's giving it to David. And look at verse 19, if you've got your Bible open. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, says Samuel. In other words, tomorrow you and your sons will be dead. And the Lord will hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. I'll say more about Samuel's message in a moment, but uh, this is a reminder to us, isn't it? That the Lord our God is king over all. He rules and reigns over all things. And he has the power and he has the authority to raise up and to tear down, to exalt and to humble. He gives victory to one nation and he brings another one down. Our times and our lives are in his hands and he's the one who determines all things. Since he's king over all, he was able to hand over the Israelites to the Philistines. 
giving victory to the Philistines and defeat to the Israelites. Because the outcome of the battle, the outcome of every battle, is in his hands. And so we all ought to bow down and humble ourselves before him. Because in him, we live and move and have our being. And we are in his hands. And he will do all that he pleases. And none of us is able to question him and say to him, what have you done? And in these days, as we go through this coronavirus crisis, we need to remember that. What has happened has not happened by chance and for no reason, but it's happened by the hand of the Lord our God, who is king over all. And so we ought to humble ourselves before him. And we ask, ought to ask him to show us mercy and to deliver us from this trouble which he has sent upon the world. But of course, we should also be reassured because the king over all is our loving Heavenly Father who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And he has promised to work out all things for the good of his people who love him. And so if you love the Lord, if you love the Lord, if you're one of his people, then you don't need to be afraid of anything. Because the king over all is on your side. He's on your side. And he has promised to make his people more than conquerors to be with us always. Well, after hearing Samuel's message of condemnation, uh, Saul fell down on the ground and he was filled with fear. The woman urged him to eat something because he was so exhausted he hadn't eaten anything all day and all night. And though at first he refused, he later accepted and he ate his final meal. It was his final meal because hadn't the Lord announced through the prophet Samuel that he would die the very next day. Well, let me go back now to Samuel's words in verses 16 to 19 and to his announcement to Saul that because Saul did not obey the Lord, the Lord has done this to him today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. God was going to use the Philistines to punish Saul for disobeying him. He was God's anointed king, after all. He was duty bound to, uh, to obey the Lord and to do his will. But instead of obeying the Lord, he disregarded the Lord and his word. And because of his unbelief and rebellion, God was now going to punish him by sending the Philistines against him. And here's the thing. God's judgment would fall not only on Saul, but on the Israelites who followed him. They were going to suffer defeat and death because they were following the wrong king. Since he was on the, the broad road, the road of unbelief and rebellion, then they were following him along the same wrong road. And that road leads only to destruction. But there was another king, wasn't there? A new and better king. There was David, who was doing the will of the Lord, taking over the promised land and conquering the enemies of the Lord, as we read last week. And the Lord was with David, and the Lord was granting him success. And the Lord not only gave success to David, but he gave success to David's men, to all who followed David. And so those who followed the wrong king were living under the judgment of God, but those who followed the true king were living under God's protection. But though David was the true king, he was only the true king for the time being. Because the Lord our God was going to send another king into the world, an even better king than David ever was. He was going to send his son into the world to be our great king. 
And as our great King, the Lord Jesus was obedient to God in all things, obeying God the Father perfectly, even to the point of death on the cross. Because it was the Father's will for our King to die for his people in order to pay for our sins with his life and to cleanse us of our guilt with his blood. And because of his obedience, even to death on the cross, God the Father raised him from the dead and exalted him to the highest place to rule and reign over all. And whoever follows him, whoever follows him, is on the narrow way, which leads eventually to everlasting life in the presence of God. What do you and I deserve? Of course, it's, it's condemnation and death, isn't it? We deserve to be condemned and to die just like Saul, because like Saul, we often doubt God's word and we disobey God's word. Just like him, we know God's word and we know his will, but just like Saul, every day we disobey God's word and we don't do his will. But even though you're a sinner who disobeys God's word every day, the good news of the gospel is that Christ the King has paid for your sins with his life. And if you're trusting in him, then you will not be condemned, but will have eternal life. Because Christ the King has paid for the sins of his people in full. And he will lead you all the way to eternal life. Saul was the wrong king to follow. And David was the new and better king. And David foreshadows Christ the king who gives eternal life to all who trust in him. And so if you've not already done so, let me say to you today, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You should go to God in prayer and confess your sins to him. And you should ask him to forgive you for the, for the sake of Christ the Saviour who died for sinners. And you should ask God to give you the free gift of eternal life. And the final thing to say today is that just as David points us to Christ the great King, so Samuel points us to Christ our great prophet. But just as Christ our great King is so much greater than David, so Christ our great prophet is so much greater than Samuel. Samuel was the, the Lord's prophet but when he was brought up from the dead, he came as a kind of ghostly figure. And he came to announce a message of condemnation and death. But Christ, our great prophet, is a much greater prophet. Because when he was brought up from the dead, he didn't come from the dead as a kind of ghostly figure who returned to the dead afterwards. No, he was raised physically, or he was raised bodily from the dead to live forever. He was resurrected from the dead, and he now lives forever and forever. And when he was raised, he didn't come to announce a message of condemnation and death. No, he came to announce a message of peace and of life. Peace with God, for all who trust in him, and everlasting life in God's presence. Just as Christ died and was raised, so all who believe in him will be raised to everlasting life in the new and better world to come. And so though we look around the world today and we see disease and death and sorrow and sadness everywhere, Christ, our great prophet, is declaring to you today, through the preaching of his word, that he has something better in store for you, if you will believe in him. Because what he has in store for you, and for all who believe in him, is not condemnation and death. 
which is what we deserve because of our sin. Now, what he has in store for us and for all who believe in him is everlasting life. Everlasting life in that new and better world to come with Christ our great King and with God our Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great King, who died for us, and who is our great prophet, who proclaims peace and life to us, and who is our great priest, who offered himself on the cross as a perfect sacrifice for sins. Help us to rely on him, and in him alone for salvation. And help us to follow him along the narrow path that leads to everlasting life in your presence. Once again, we lament before you because of the coronavirus crisis, and we plead with you for mercy on us and on all of your creation. Help the governments of the world as they try to cope with the crisis. Help all those who are caring for the sick and the dying. Help people everywhere to be wise and alert and to comply with all of the restrictions that are in place. Keep safe the weak and the vulnerable. And we pray that the number of new infections would go down all over the world. And that the vaccines will be available in every nation. And that they will be effective. We pray too that you'll turn the hearts and minds of people around the world to seek after you. We pray that they'll turn from their unbelief and rebellion and turn to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, trusting in him for forgiveness and peace with you and for the hope of everlasting life in the new and better world to come. And we pray that all over the world, many more people will be added to the church and that Christ's kingdom will be extended throughout the earth. We pray too that you'll help us in Emmanuel, help all those in our congregation who are cut off from their families and loved ones and who are feeling isolated. Help those who are anxious about work and who are worried about how to cope financially. Help those who are homeschooling their children and who are struggling with it. Help the children and young people to cope with all the restrictions and the interruption to their education. Help those who feel that things are too much for them. Help us to know that we can look to you, our faithful Father, for all that we need. And help us to be patient in our adversity and to trust in you. And finally, we pray that once again, churches will be reopened so that we're able to gather together to hear your word and to pray to you. And we're able to gather together around the Lord's table to proclaim his death until he comes. And we're able to gather together for fellowship in the name of our Savior. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will work all things out so that we're able to gather together again. And will you work in us so that our desire to be in your presence and our desire to be with one another will not weaken, but will only become stronger. Because this is what we will do forever and forever in glory. And we ask all of these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's praise God by singing, O oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. See what a morning, gloriously bright, with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Fold in the great cross to the light as the angels announce Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan brought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice. Fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen for As 
in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb Years of voice speaking, calling her name Is the master, the Lord raised to life again The voice that spans the years Speaking life, stirring hope, bringing peace to us Will sound till he appears For he lives, Christ is risen for the dead we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.